say you have a bad grade and that's one one of the things that I've struggled with a long time is that I went to the like extreme lengths um and like said you know I'm a failure and you know I'm never gonna get this degree or whatever and you know I had to like teach myself well one bad grade you know just taking it easy and just saying you know one bad grade is not going to define your entire degree or your career um so i kind of liked where the book explained is that you know taking baby steps and understanding that this is something that's going to take a long time and you have to work on it if you know especially if that's something that you need to be comfortable with hmm. very good next person No one? No one has tips and advice on how to cultivate, develop self-esteem, boost self-esteem? Today's not media day for me. All right. Okay. All right. Who would uh, like to read um, page 225, the beginning of chapter 15? Try to get you guys to participate more and get active in here rather than just sitting here listening to me all day long. So who would like to read chapter 225? Can you hear me? I don't mind. Yeah, Where do you want me to stop? Uh, let's read. My name is Rebecca Silverstein. I'm a licensed clinical social worker handling with insurances through Alma's insurance program. My been app, been iPad is going crazy. Me. Oh. <laughs> Sheesh. Okay. Let's uh, read um, page 225. all the way to 227, okay? Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, why did my page just do that? Okay. Cool. So, overcoming, overcoming low self-esteem. So, disturbing feelings, such as depression, anxiety, shame, guilt, anger, envy, jealousy, are all often rooted in low self-esteem, an opinion. If you're prone to experiencing these feelings, then you may well have a problem with your self-esteem. You may assume that you're only as worthwhile as your achievements. Online presence, love life, social status, attractiveness, or financial powers. If you link your work to your temporary conditions, and if for some reason they diminish your self-esteem, component two. Alternatively, you may take a long-standing view of yourself. However, favorably, the conditions mentioned, your self-esteem may be chronically low. Whatever case you can follow is the philosophical or self-acceptance that we outline in this chapter, which are significantly improve the attitude you hold towards yourself. Identifying these issues of self-esteem. Do you want me to continue? Yes, all the way to 227. Okay. Implicit in the concept of self-esteem is the notion of estimating or rating and measuring your worth. If you have a high self-esteem, then your measure of your value of worth is high. Conversely, if you have a low self-esteem, your estimate value is low. Condemning yourself globally is a form of overgeneralizing, known as labeling or self-doubting. We talk about this in Chapter 2. This is thinking of errors between low self-esteem Labeling yourself makes you feel worse and can lead to counterproductive actions, such as avoidance, isolation, rituals, and procrastination and perfectionists. Um, to name a few, examples of labeling or self-downing include the statements below. Um, 
When you measure your work on the basis of one of the more external factors, you're likely to go up and down, like like a yo-yo. In both moves, self-concept because life is challengeable. Developing low self-esteem. One approach to tackling your low self-esteem is to boost your estimate you have of your worth. The underlying problem, however, it still remains. In lacking investment, your self-esteem can go down as well as up. Self-acceptance is an alternative to, uh, alternative to boosting self-esteem and tackles the problem by removing self-rating if you don't have a sturdy belief that your value is, I don't know how to say that word, but it says built in. You may have difficulty concluding that you have any word at all and that things go wrong. As a human being, you're a unique, multifaceted individual. Um, you're ever changing and developing. It lists a few things. So the following are the principles of self-acceptance. Read them, reread them, think them over, and put them into practice in your daily life. The principles are good sense, but we're leaving it up to decide how common they sense. The principles of self-help. Thinking methods develop. But yeah, and it talks about Albert. You want me to finish this, Albert Ellis? So, so somebody else can pick up from there. Okay. Somebody else can pick up from there. You left off on page two two seven. Someone else can pick up from page 227. You guys hear me? Someone wrap next page. Miss Valerie. All right. Is there 227? Yeah, she, she got done to page 227, right? So let's go to 228. Oops, sorry. Okay. Okay, were you at understanding that you have worth because you're human? Is that where you're at? Page 228, Valerie. All the way on top. 228. Beginning of 228. All right, appreciating that you're too complex to globally measure or rate. You may mistakenly define your whole worth or even your entire self on the basis of your individual parts. Doing so is pointless because humans are ever-changing, dynamic, fallible, and complex creatures. Humans have the capacity to work on correcting less desirable behaviors and maximizing more desirable behaviors. You have the distinctive ability to strive for self-improvement, to maximize your potential, and to learn from your and others' histories, mistakes, and accomplishments. In short, you have the capacity to develop the ability to accept yourself as you are, while still endeavoring to improve yourself if you so choose. Consider a bowl of fresh hand-picked fruit beautiful in almost every respect. Now imagine that one of the apples in the fruit bowl is bruised. Do you consider the whole bowl of fruit to be worthless? Of course not. It's a beautiful bowl of fruit with a single bruised apple. Avoid overgeneralizing by saying that your perfect any by saying that your imperfections are simply facets of yourself and do not define the whole of you. Do you want me to continue, Venerable? Yes. Okay. Letting go of labeling. Self-acceptance means deciding to resist labeling yourself at all, and rather to entertain the idea that ratings are inappropriate to the human condition. For example, you lied to a friend once. Does that make you a liar forever and for all time? You used to eat meat, but then you decided to go vegetarian. Are you still a meat eater because you once ate meat? You failed at one or more tasks that were important to you. 
can you legitimately conclude that you are an utter failure? By the same token, if you succeeded at one important task, are you now a uh, thoroughgoing success? As you can see by reviewing these examples, basing your self-esteem on one incident, one action, or one experience is a gross overgeneralization, believing you're more than the sum of your parts. Take a look at figure 15.1. The big I is comprised of dozens of little I's. So what's the point of the figure? When you evaluate yourself totally on the basis of one characteristic, thought, action, or intention, you're making the thinking error that a single part, the little I equals to the whole, the big I. So figure 15.1, which do you see first, the big I or all the little I's? Hmm. I see the big I. Hmm. I used to see all the little I's. I used to nitpick hmm. Keep going. at myself so much. All right. Along similar lines, consider a finely woven tapestry comprised of countless variations of texture, color, and pattern. Within this tapestry, you may find one or more flaws where the colors fail to meet or the patterns are slightly out of sync. The flaws in the tiny details don't cancel out, don't cancel out the beauty or value of the overall piece. And what about the Venus del uh, de Milo? Over the years, she's lost a limb or two, but the officials at the there don't say, I'm sorry, she's flawed, put her in the bin. The fact that the statue is damaged doesn't dim diminish or define its overall worth. The statue is valued as it is, and the absence of arms doesn't negate, doesn't negate the impact it has on our understanding of the evolution of art. If your child, sibling, or nephew failed a spelling test, would you judge them a total loser, would you encourage them to think of themselves as a global failure based entirely on one action? If not, why are you doing this to yourself? Start acting in accordance with the belief that your parts do not define your wholeness. If you truly believe this, what do you do when you fail at doing something, behave badly or wickedly, or notice that you have a physical imperfection or character flaw? How do you expect to feel? when endorsing this belief. Take a pack of self-adhesive notes and a large flat surface. A wall or a, dark, a door works well. Or try a mate if she has a few spare minutes. Write down on one of the notes a characteristic that you as a whole person possess, then stick the note on the wall, door, or volunteer. Keep doing this, writing down all the aspects of yourself that you can think of until you run out of characteristics for sticky notes. Now step back and admire your illustration of your complexity as a human being. Appreciate the fact that you cannot legitimately be rated globally. Wow, that's beautifully written. There's a reason why I'm asking each person to read out of this chapter. Because you see, we have a very unhappy world. And it starts within who we are, why we are unhappy with ourselves. Now, this chapter talks about the uniqueness of each person. And so, therefore, we have a class of however many we have here. And I want you guys, the reason why I see the power of reading out loud is that you see it, and you see yourself doing it, and it applies to you. And you're like, wow, when you read it out loud, you put a lot of actions. Oh, <clears throat> A lot of your neurological workings in bring it in bringing all of these up to awareness up to consciousness <clears throat> when we stay silent and we just take it all in and not participate it has very little effectiveness when it comes to learning one of the most important chapters of CBT uh, this chapter also explains why people are unhappy and they're always angry or they're always, yeah. always uh, nitpicking or 
could never seem to find anything positive in their life, whether at work or at school. So when you guys pay close attention to small details in this chapter, you're like, wow, that explains why Susan, Betsy, Karen is always acting like that. This explains why Tom, Dick, and Harry is always like that. And uh, this is where we cultivate compassion out of deep understanding in Buddhism. And this chapter directly relates to the next chapter, which is anger. <laughs> you see, when we, when we beat ourselves up over the smallest mistakes or we find that flaw within us, and then we, we, we judge ourselves, we're so heavy on ourselves, then we make this global conclusion about us that we're unworthy, there's no value to us, any one of our characteristics, any one of the little things about us. And then we walk out and we're so self-conscious. All these seep within your subconscious very quickly. And it operates under the subconscious very quickly. So that when you walk outside and someone looks at you, in your mind you're like, Can I help you? <laughs> I apologize. There's something on my face, <laughs> Karen. <laughs> uh, notice when you guys were little and when you guys were adolescents, notice, you notice you were very self-conscious at wherever you went. And when certain friends or colleagues or classmates look at you, just because there's something about you. I mean, look, each and every single one of you, there's a uniqueness about the features of your face, arm, legs, everything about you. Okay. Hair color, eye color, so on and so on. And some people just, it strikes them as you are unique. Imagine if all humans look the same. Imagine all humans sound the same. Imagine they just, that would just be like robot. That would just be like iRobot in the, you know, the movie iRobot by Will Smith. And so it would just be like, oh, just another robot. You know, oh, well, just another human, right? Um, yeah, I used to work with Mary Lee. I used to be a jeweler, and Mary Lee described her husband as one who likes to go into the mall, sit there, and just watch humans. <laughs> I was like, what? That's a thing? <laughs> watch it. I had, a, I had a school resource officer, Officer Smith, where of which after my graduation in high school and upon his retirement, he wrote in an article in the St. Pete Times as he is a man that likes to go at night and watch owls through his binoculars. Well, he's a police officer, so I would imagine he's, he's tired. So he, he's a ma he's, I, I, like he's so cute. Valerie, open mic, Valerie, open mic. Sorry. I know I'm cute, thank you. No, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about my cousin Jacob, all right? I'm I heard, not a Hernandez. <laughs> I heard it. So, so anyways, you know, back to Officer Smith is that he's probably so tired of looking at humans that now he go look at owls at like 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I, I read the article and I'm like, wow, I guess I've seen it all. <laughs> the uniqueness in birds and owls and humans, simply put. So, you know, it, it when we see that we're all interconnected, with uh, this one little small world of 8 billion people, we all suffer. When, when, when people truly see the first noble truth, that we are all subject to suffering, they, will, they would beat themselves up a little less. And as they stand there in the train, on, in the subway, and they watch people who are sitting, the old woman who is sitting, the young girl who is pregnant on the left, uh, the guy who just got out of soccer this, they realize that everyone is suffering. Everyone is going through the same thing you're going through. And they're not there to judge you. So take it easy. No one's there to judge you. No one has something to say about how you look and, and or what color shoes you have. Or they got, they're got so deep in their world, they're living in their minds. Just like how all of us are living in our minds. This is why a person can be in a room filled with people and say, I'm still lonely. Can be in a crowded place in New York City, filled with people, laughing, giggling, smiling, joking, talking. And yet, you can be part of that crowd and say, I am the most loneliest person on this planet. 
right now. Right in New York, right in the middle of Times Square. We all have had that feeling at some point in our life. Or if not, you will. The mind left unrestrained, left unattended to, will do that to you. I've had that feeling before. Heck, I've been to many parties in my younger days, but yet still so lonely. Could not relate to anyone. And if I tried, in my mind, of course, you play out all sorts of scenarios, and you're like, they would never understand where I'm coming from. Uh huh. So, anyways, I just wanted to. I was supposed to say this earlier before I started asking people to volunteer, but. Um, but now you all know why I'm asking people to read out loud in this very important section. Anytime when I feel something is very important, I like each person to participate as you will get something out of it. That's the point. I loved reading when my teachers asked me to read in class. It's like, number one, you practice reading. Number two, you know, if you don't read, then you're not going to get what's going on. And you could forget. Some of these chapters, you should never forget. For the rest of your life, as long as you are human, you should never, ever forget. Ever. Because these are the common problems found in human minds that will come and attack you. You understand? If you are not conscious and aware, when these things are playing out, when you're going through a divorce, when you're going through a breakup, when something, when someone says something bad about you at work or school, these are the things that comes up. You have to be able to catch it. This is no different. This is mental hygiene. This is no different than remembering what constitutes diabetes and what constitutes high blood pressure. So if, if we told you 180 over 90, you know, if, if, if that's just an example, if we gave you that number and we told you every time you check your blood pressure, just, just be aware of 180 over 90, 180 over 100, okay, then you know it's, it's critical level, right? You know when it's need of clinical attention. But we don't do this when it comes to mental hygiene, looking after our minds, looking after our psychological well-being. So when something happens in your life, you get demoted. You don't get the position that you want. Um, you go through a breakup. You know, you're being rejected. Oh, that's a big one right there. It's like, will you be my Valentine's? No. Go away. <laughs> and we got, oh, yeah. It only takes one rejection for your world to spin out of control and to feel that, wait, wait, is it, wait there's some, it's something about me? Oh, there must be something about me. Oh, hell, this is my third rejection in five years. Your mind is going to play all sorts of tricks on you. So some of these chapters you cannot forget because when it does play tricks on you, you know exactly which element of surprise that it is. And what are we doing? We are reading those elements right now. If you all were detectives, let's say you guys were our... Detectives that investigate people who steal and part of your detective school is well, what constitutes stealing? Well taking something that is not given right not paying for it either by concealment or whatever and the last element is walking through the walking past the POS point of sale in any store so if that's your only in one job to do is to catch people who steal and you forget one of those elements that would make you a very ineffective detective. <laughs> so when you study CBT, you need to understand all of these elements. I am training all of you to become spiritual physicians, your own psychologist as much as as possible. You're not going to get to PhD level, but you need to always guard your mind. This is what the Buddha emphasizes, always guarding your mind when it, when it beats you up. When it beats you up about the way how you look, and it beats you up the way how you perform. Self-image, self-performance. Couldn't tell you how many times I have to counsel people, and it all comes back to these little basic 
fundamentals that we're studying here in CBT. Okay, page 230, who would like to volunteer? Can be the same person, can be a different person. I don't care, I just want you guys to read. Page 230. Line, yes. Six steps. Page 230 in the third edition. You have this edition? Yeah, uh, it says the six steps were talking and listening. No, this is page 230, acknowledging your ever changing nature, chapter 15. You have the physical book or are you on a PDF? PDF. Huh. Yeah, page 230, all the way on top, acknowledging your ever changing nature. Like, what can I read it to? Lulu, you like to read it? No, 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 but I want to know the page, but I, like, I want to see it because I don't know where you guys are reading mm -hmm. from where. You don't have, you don't have this, this edition? No, I don't. Yeah, so it's okay. It's just, just listen, because okay. it's all right. Okay, are you ready for uh, page two thirty? This is the third edition, right? Yes, third edition. Okay, yeah. Honorable, if you'd like, I can show my book while we're reading. I'm not sure if you guys are gonna be able to see it, but I can try. So it's okay. Okay. See, this is why we have to pay attention during class, right? If you have the third edition, either PDF or in physical copy, right? This, this, this is where we have to be on point, right? I, the fact that I can't see people's faces and the fact that people are hesitant and reluctant to participate lets me know that you guys are probably playing PlayStation 4 while listening to me. Right? In a traditional class, Typically, you know, you can't do anything. You In a traditional class, you come in, number one, you pay. This is free. Maybe I should start charging money. Number two, once you're in class, you're, you're, your professor's got an eye of a hawk. And number three, you have no choice but to participate because you pay for the class and you have to, if you want to, if you want to be some, <laughs> a good student, you have to participate. But these Zoom things or whatever, these, these Discord thing, you know. All right, go ahead. Did you find page 230? We are still scrolling. Anyone else? Anyone else would like to read page 230? I have 230 if you can find it. Um, yes, go ahead. Forgive it. I'm on the PDF, though. It says forgiving flaws in yourself. your ever-changing nature page 230 230 I have it in that as well you guys I just took two pictures um, I recommend if, if you don't Go have the third edition just to buy it because the first edition is showing me something else the PDF that I sent you guys the ebook so I go off the, the hardcover the paperback for the third edition Hold on, hold on. Do you guys know who here can tell me about the first and the third edition? Who here can put the the pieces of the puzzles together about the first? Oh, my answer. Oh, oops, excuse me. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I'm not a woman. Oof. This tank top, right? My left nipple was showing on YouTube. Oh, oh. oh my gosh, venerable. I mean, it was like, hi, how are you? Uh, woo, hallelujah, excuse me. Anyways, <laughs> and it happens a lot too, by the way. If you guys uh, profile Theravada monks, especially young monks, and they're doing temp. And so this is like a more modern and industrialized angsa, but the traditional angsa is a square piece that literally goes across like your miss. Miss Universe or Miss USA 2022 and some of the monks they actually have muscles and they have a chest 
So it kind of shifts over a little bit and their nipple shows. <laughs> and it's just like, wow, yeah, you really are Mr. Universe now. Huh? All right. So <clears throat> now the first edition and the third edition. The first edition is for students who cannot afford the third edition. Okay. But those who can afford the third edition, which is anywhere from $15 to $24, they get the actual physical copy. So that's the difference between the first edition, the PDF, the free PDF, and the third edition. Now, a student who paid close attention to every single session would realize that, oh, he's reading out of the third edition because every time when I read out of it, I say the page number and which edition it is, right? So unless there is extreme financial hardship, in my mind, I'm expecting people to kind of like, oh, maybe I should get the, the latest edition. Now, people who are too busy cannot study CBT or is now only surface level CBT, then they just rely on the first edition and get them the most out of it and then continue to upgrade by deep listening skills, by and through these discussion. And doing this on a large mass scale level, meaning however dozens and hundreds of students, whoever, I'm measuring everybody. Not like I'm putting a microscope on each and every single one of you, but I just wanted to see who's dedicated, who is curious about CBT, who is willing to spend the time, who is willing to do the homework, who is actually doing the exercises, who is doing all these things. Out of my own curiosity and to conclude my own personal research so that I can design a better program after the completion of this Discord. I can come up with more programs because I'm trying to figure out why people are lazy, why they're not lazy, who's participating, who's got kids, who's got school, who's got to pick up grandma, you know, who can't be here, how many people are late, usually when we start, how many people come in later. I'm measuring everything. So that's what people don't know what I'm doing. See, I pretend like I don't know. And I'm like, huh? Like, does someone read? <laughs> Trust me, this teacher is not dumb. My job, I, I, you know, I, I just know a student who is dedicated and stay dead on point, dead on track. That's the one. Every professor have an eye like that. Every professor is looking for that one student. <clears throat> if they're lucky, maybe two. <clears throat> so, all right, go ahead and, and read page two, 230. And then after today, after today, after today, you guys can think about getting the third edition and this is weird because I, I don't see the third edition in the the workbook but the first edition has a workbook that accompanies it um so regardless if you have the first or third edition in order to if you really care about your memory and if you really take the words suggested here to heart about remembering the elements of CBT. If you want to be bulletproof and never suffer again in regards to self-esteem, self-concept, self-value, <laughs> all of these chapters that we've gone through about emotions, uh, boiling things out of proportion, so on and so on, a diligent student would get the workbook and really do the workbook and really do the exercise. If you dissect your mind and separate the components, untangling the tangle. That's what's going on here. It's that we're trying to untangle the tangle. We're trying to compartmentalize our minds and separate each one. Self-esteem over here, anger over here, selfishness over here, um, you know, delusional thoughts over here, you know, hallucinating thoughts over here. We're trying to like separate each one and work on each one. Each chapter is designed to do that. It does a great job of doing it. Without the CBT structure, 
you would just be just in a hairball, you know, of problems. Ahead and um, uh, page two hundred and thirty. Go ahead. Okay, start as as a human being, correct? And where do you want me to end? Um, and the there. Let's read that all the way to page 233, but we're not going to do the uh, examples on page 231 and page 232. Oh, well, actually, you know, we're just gonna, we're, we're going to skip the forgiving flaws in yourself and others, and then we're going to go to the why self-acceptance beliefs work, okay? So read page 230, skip 231, and then page 232. Ashley, hold on before you start. It's all over the place tonight. Okay. <laughs> Who has any questions so far? Any confusion so far based on what I have said? No confusion. Okay, everyone's on point. All right. I got to pause in case people have confusions or remarks or comments, questions. Okay, go ahead. Have at it, Armani. So, as human beings, your nature is to be ever changing person. If you measure, even if you measure all your personal characteristics today and come up with a global rating for yourself, it will be wrong tomorrow. Mm. Why? Because each day you change a little, age very slightly, and gather a few new experiences. Consider yourself a work in progress and try holding a flexible attitude towards yourself. Every skill you acquire or interest you develop efficiently produces a change within you. Every hardship you, whether Every, uh, sorry, every hardship you weather, every jo um, joyous event that visits you, and every mundane occurrence you endure causes you to develop and adapt. Um, accepting your um, nature. So, sorry if we are the ones to break it to you, but human beings are flawed and imperfect. You may be the pretty impressive product of evolution. But essentially, you're just the most powerful animal on the planet. Even if you believe you're the creation of divine entity, do you really think that the divine um, design brief was perfect? <sighs> Sorry, y'all. Perfection. Maybe being complex, different, and within an built tendency to make this takes a lot of part of the plan. When people say you're only human, they have a point. Never ever can you flawlessly stop making mistakes. And neither can anyone else. It's just how we're built. During this process of accepting yourself, you may experience sadness, disappointment, or remorse for your blunder. These healthy negative emotions may be uncomfortable, but usually they can lead to self-helping, corrective and adaptive behaviors. Self-condemnation or self-depreciation on the other hand, are likely to be led to far more intense, unhealthy negative emotions, such as depression, hurt, guilt, and shame. So you're more likely to adopt self-defeating and maladaptive behaviors, such as avoidance or giving up. Who else do you know who's exactly, and yes, we mean exactly, like you? The correct answer is no one, because human cloning, thing, cloning things have been taken off yet so you're in fact quite unique just like everyone else skipping 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 okay taking care of yourself overly wait taking yourself overly serious is not a successful path to obtaining good mental health which we talked about in chapter 24. your individual human ability can be both amusing and illuminating things about comedy programs and films much of them makes these shows funny. It's a way that characters behave. The mistakes that makes their social blunders, their physical ability, no, physical, okay, anyways, their personal particu uh, particulars and on. When you laugh at these characters, you aren't being malicious. 
You just recognize the echo. You just recognize the echoes of yourself and the entire human experience in them. Furthermore, you're unlikely to put down these characters on the basis of their errors. Give yourself a similar benefit of doubt, accepting the assistance, assistance of personal shortcomings can help you understand your own limitations and identify the areas that you may wish to target for change. For example, we have a couple of our own quirks that we try to accept and even celebrate as unique. Rob possesses a sense of direction which can leave them lost in empty car parks for hours. Believe us when we say there's no map or sat need helps. Sometimes we wonder if we, if he even knows where he lives. Rena has her own special pronunciation for many words. That's to say that she gets them wrong. There are only two of our personal foldables that we prepare to commit to print. Um, what page is this? Do you want me to continue? When did you stop? Um, using self-acceptance to a self-improvement. Okay, let, let me, all right. Thank you for reading. Um, yep. on back to page 230 when it says acknowledging your ever-changing nature. Aha! Who's able to connect that to our last Sunday, last Sunday's talk on the non-self? Anybody here? Anybody here got a light bulb? That ding in their minds on last Sunday's talk on the non-self? Matter of fact, over the past two weekends, we've been talking about the non-self and the five aggregates. And now do you see 200 on page 230? You see the first paragraph concurring with Buddhism. Look at that. Moving on to accepting your fallible nature, valuing your uniqueness, uh, is that the first thing that my professor said, Dr. Anne Giroux, Ecker College, the first thing she said when she began the class, of course all of us are all excited until she said this, she says, I am as messed up as the rest of us. <laughs> and we're all like, oh, we thought you were enlightened. <laughs> I did. I thought she was enlightened. Every professor that walked in my class, I thought they were all fully enlightened beings. Well, at least academically. I thought that was really uh, humble of her to start off the class like that, teaching counseling psychology. And that's just that, accepting our fallible nature and the fallible nature of other people. It is when we want something else that is different, we want to change that. And we want to change that in other people. Is, is where suffering start to begin, start to arise. There are, there's no perfect humans. From a cellular level, to a psychological level, to a brain structure, neurological level, to circumstantial level in humans. When you study humans and when you study counseling psychology, or if you go back to my YouTube and Instagram or Facebook and look at the one-on-one -on -one sessions that I've done with people, and I'm tracing back childhood, I'm, I'm just tracing back, I just got to know, like, how do we get here? And you hear all of these stories about single parent homes. No parent homes, drugs, abuse, addiction, trauma. Um, and uh, you realize that's where we started cultivating the fallible nature of us. To others that we see on TV. Times Magazine, whatever. We see the outer image elsewhere 
in the world and we're like, well, I want to be like her. I want to be like him. Why can't I be like her? Why can't I be like him? Why do I have these deficits of skills, deficits of qualities and so on and so on? Well, because you didn't, you didn't, you didn't raise up. You didn't grow up a certain way as expected. Things happened along the way that was traumatic that based on the causes and condition uh, lead us to where we are today. Let me, let me read this real quick as it relates this chapter and the next chapter that we're moving into. Oh boy. Who did I send it to from? Let me see here. I'm reflecting for a second. Oh, they came up. Hmm. I I will reserve this article about Will Smith in the next chapter as it has to do with trauma. It, um, I don't want to, I don't want to jam this article in. It could confuse people. Um, but it's a very interesting article. It opens up a lot of insight uh, when it comes to fallible nature, trauma response and anger. I'll, I'll, I'll wait until we, we, we get there. It's a very insightful. And if I have to send an article to my email and preserve it, it's really good. Really, really good. Um, okay, so. There's some of you are very young. I mean, the youngest, the youngest one on here is 13 years old. And so, of course, young, you have lack of life experience when it comes to fallible natures, unless you have lived... Uh, you know, in in my case, 34 years old, but as an interpreter, I, both law and medicine, I get to watch all sorts of fallacies, you know, fallible natures in humans across the board. 90-year-olds making mistakes of a 20-year-old. And I'm just like, what? You know, you, you. I can write so many books on the things that I have seen in my career. So, so I can... So that's all you guys need to know is that not everybody's perfect. We all have fallible natures, both big and small, and we're all working on it. The fact that we're here is an indication that we're trying to do something about it. And uh, we're taking steps towards that. Right? Don't don't 90 and then realize, oh, <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to change this part at, at, what, at 90? Okay. Well, I think you've delayed a little. Valuing your uniqueness, less one day you're gonna find someone that's gonna love you and your uniqueness, your your birthmark, 
They're going to love you for your tone of voice, the way how you say things, the little weird things about you. They're going to love. They, well, that's, they're looking for it. People who accept you for who you are will find all sorts of ways to express all the little things about you mean so much to them. Um, and, you know, we try to hide all these little flaws when we're dating or going out in the world, right? And we're with a partner. You know, we're just like, oh my God, he could never, he could never find out about this about me, ever, ever. I will take this to the grave with me. But the more we try to hide it, the more fear it evokes. The more fear we evokes, you know, people can see that. People can see that. You're not you, you're not true. Be you and be true. I couldn't tell you how many times I've said that. Be you, be true. You are who you are. Uh, accept, accept that. Well, this is also part of not giving up. Okay? This is also the art of not giving up. Simply put, you know, when are you going to, you know, love you, accept you for who you are? There's some things we can change. There's something we cannot change. By the way, you know, the art of not giving up. <laughs> I, I gave a TikTok on that one, and it blew up, like, Blew up like I think two hundred thousand views. It's because we we care way too much, way too much, and we have to strike that balance about what other people think of us, what we think of ourselves, and how we operate thereafter on a daily basis. We have any uh, remarks, comments, questions so far in the middle of this chapter so far. Who would like to read uh, page 234, Understanding Acceptance Doesn't Mean Giving Up? Page 234. Miss Valerie. All right. Just give me one second. It's so all the way to the next page in being inspired to change. Okay. Now consider two very different responses to the interview. Response A. Oh no. He leaves the oh no no no. Just go all the way down to understanding that acceptance doesn't mean giving up. We don't have to do the examples. Oh okay. Um. You're saying in the example of Wendy. No. Go all the way down. The way you see understanding that oh, acceptance doesn't mean feet. giving up. Mm -hmm. Bottom of the page. Oh. Okay. Um, in response B, Wendy is understandably disappointed with how the interview turned out. She's able to recognize her skills deficit because she accepts herself with this specific deficit. She takes concrete steps towards improving her skills. Based. Val, 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 Val. Val, all, all the way down yeah. where it says understanding that acceptance doesn't mean giving up all bottom of the page um, page 234 all the way down understanding that acceptance doesn't mean giving up all big bold letters oh okay the example of Wendy we don't suggest that she we don't suggest that she must resign herself to a life of unemployment simply because she's been left simply because she's been somewhat left behind by technological advancement. Why should she? Clearly she can do things to ensure that she stands a good chance of getting back into the job market. In Wendy's case, self-acceptance means that she can view herself as worthwhile while getting on with self-improvement in specific areas of her life. By contrast, if Wendy refuses to accept herself and puts herself down, She's far more likely to resign, perhaps even condemn herself to her current state of unemployment. 
Resignation requires little or no effort, but self-acceptance can involve a lot of personal effort. High frustration tolerance, HFT, is the ability to tolerate discomfort and hard and hard work in the short term en route to achieving an identified long-term goal. In response B, in the job interview example, Wendy accepts herself and holds an HFT attitude. She's prepared to do the work necessary to reach her goal of getting a job. Low frustration tolerance, LFT, is unwillingness to tolerate short-term pain for long-term gain. An LFT attitude is present in statements such as, it's too difficult to change. This is just the way I am. Now, I may as well just give up. Resignation and LFT go hand in hand. In Wendy's response A, she refuses to accept herself in view of her recent experience and resigns herself to unemployment. Resignation may seem like an easier option than self-acceptance, because it means that you have to do less. However, people tend to feel pretty miserable when they resign and condemn themselves, refusing to put effort into improving their situation. High frustration tolerance, very important. Never forget HFT. Never forget LFT also. In life, you're going to have it. You're going to have it. You're going to have to fight through it. Um... And you're gonna you're gonna be able to identify people who are also low frustration tolerance. They give up very easy. They get angry very easy. They give up very easy. They quit. It's too it's too unbearable. <laughs> Within minutes, it's unbearable. So monks, right? We cultivate high frustration tolerance. You all don't even understand the amount of frustration tolerance that we have to tolerate. And for millenniums, we all had to endure very grumpy teachers, <laughs> very strict and grumpy teachers. <laughs> and whatever they said, we did. Clean the temple, clean the shrine, sweep, clean, mop, go build this, go do that. That's it. It's no arguing. Simply put. Um, and uh, it will serve you well. This is exactly what Bruce Lee said, right? The you are the bamboo stick, and you you go with the wind, and that's cultivating high frustration tolerance. It's going with the flow, no matter how uncomfortable it is in the moment, both emotionally and psychologically. You want to survive this world, you will do that. What happens when you don't? Yeah. I had a question really quick. Um, so I don't know if you remember, I was speaking to that, um, she was a temporary nun in the past Yes. and she said she got kicked out of a monastery. Um, is it because maybe she didn't follow like the Sangha, like the precepts or maybe what the community was, was requesting or like, could they kick you out if you're just like, I don't want to clean the bathroom. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's yes. what I was thinking. Yes. Yeah, all right. Let's let's switch subject to the monastery life as it relates to following directions, instructions carefully. This is where I'm very honest to you all. <laughs> I've been honest to you all. Um, but you see the days of Ajahn Chah. You see, why do people seek out monks? Why do people seek out Buddhism? It's because they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. They want a way out. They want to learn the way out. We hold the key to the way out. And Ajahn Chah was one of them, Ajahn Mu, Ajahn Li. These were all previously fully enlightened beings. You couldn't Google a Jan Cha 
and said, oh, there he is. You know what, baby? Let's go catch a plane right now. Just go, let's go say hi to Jen Cha. Now, the man was very hard to find and track. A Jun, what is it, a Jun Lee or a Jun Moon? If you were dumb, he wouldn't accept you. <laughs> now, what is the definition of dumb? I don't know. I wasn't there. This is so, so I have heard. So have I have heard. Evo man sutan. So, you know, um, when you're there, it, it, you, you got to reflect. I mean, it's, it's. We can blame both the teacher and the students, but more so on the students. It's because you're there because you want, you want, you, we have an open mic, lime juice, you have an open mic. Um, not all teachers are perfect. Teachers have their temperaments. They have their bad days, and it's still very hard for for me to, I mean, I, I don't know how I'm going to ever accept the position of an abbot with the amount of expectations I have. And I haven't even fully expressed the expectations I have for all of you. I have decided to withhold my policies, certain policies, I have decided to withhold and not to implement just because, just because, <laughs> just because I'm trying to measure you all first. I'm trying to measure modern day humans and modern day students as to how flexible they are, how they can tolerate pain, how they can tolerate things. I mean, they're already in here. You guys are already in here. People who are already in this class is because they, they're lost. Number one, they're lost. Number two, they're angry at themselves and at the world. So in this tradition, we are the Kalyanamita. We are so a friend would want to be friendly and helpful and cheerful and to help you through things. Of course, that probably could not be said back in the day of the Thai forest traditions. The Thai forest tradition is extremely disciplined with all of the previous teachers and so and they have higher expectations i mean they i mean especially if you're from the west or if you look white <laughs> are white looked white from the west not asian and you crawl into a for thai forest monasteries the teachers previously the days of yesterdays is that they they they, they have this impression already that the Western student is lazy, that the Western student needs to be disciplined more than Asian students. You know, they have all of these impressions already. So, um, it is what it is. So, you know, when a person is being kicked out of the monastery, number one, if you wanted to interview them, you would ask them, well, what, how did you contribute to you being kicked out? Simply put. But we also blame the teacher for not, I mean, they're humans too, and they're not arahants, or, or at the time of kicking the student out. I mean, it has to be quite severe. It's something to be investigated, actually. It's because one of the qualities of a Buddha is to be able to match the student's level and to use wise words to tame them. To tame them. <laughs> tame the student that needs to be tamed, right? Um, and you know, it's just, I'm pretty sure those Thai forest monks were not, I mean, I'm going to guess cause I don't know. I would say that they're not fully equipped to deal with the different types, different levels, different gradient, you know, you got to meet people where they are. That's what I'm trying to do. That's what I've been doing for the past four or five years is to meet students where they are, are in life and to select appropriate teachings, appropriate recommendation and advice so that they can move on about their life. Of course, the CBT, this book applies to from high school level and up. Heck, even 10th grade.
it, it's safe for a ninth, a ninth grader, a tenth grader to read this and understand the point, I feel. So it's quite universal. I've been fortunate enough to find this particular resource and apply it to all of you. Uh, but you, you've got to really tick somebody off to get kicked out of a, a temple, willfully, knowingly, and intentionally defiant, extremely disrespectful, uh, did not follow the the rule, the monastic. But again, I don't know this nun. I don't know the circumstances around it. If any one of you, you know, wanted to learn the monastic ways and to fully discipline yourself and the meaning and definition of discipline yourself in this lifetime. One should think about traveling to Thailand or Myanmar and find a very strict teacher and study un under them, under their supervision, under their guidance. It would, it would, it would change you very much so. This was the same thing that my dad asserted about going into the military, how he values people who were previously in the military because they have installed self-discipline in the, the soldiers. You know? And, and so is the medical field. Every time when I talk about self-discipline, I'd say, you know, look at the medical field, the legal field, look at our lawyers, look at our doctors. You know, they have been disciplined. They needed to have a very serious conversation with themselves and the way how they carry themselves the world and the way how they carry themselves every morning. I know what to look for in a doctor. I know what to look for in a lawyer. And to see if they're on point, if they actually uh, care, um, you know, so, but you know, I hold a lot of these people to a very high standards. Yeah, uh, it needs to be or else can you imagine doctors showing up to work not caring? It's like, yeah, let's do surgery. Doop, doop, doop. Oh, well, he's dead. Next. <laughs> it's like a McDonald's of surgery. That's not good. Um, or a McDonald's of law. It's like, not guilty, guilty, oh well, life in prison, yeah, okay, well, next. <laughs> what, kind, what kind of a quality of life there for people who is uh, affected by both law and medicine? So the discipline thing is a very, very important aspect in a human life. And proper self-discipline leads to proper practice in this tradition, period. Because what did the Buddha say? You know, everything the Buddha have said you can, you can meditate on for a lifetime. It would take you this lifetime and more lifetimes to come to fully understand the point of the Buddha. When he said a mind has been brought under control, well attended to, and is well disciplined, does in fact yield great happiness. But in order to, dis before you discipline your mind, everything in your life has to be in order. If your room is messed up right now, you lack self-discipline. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you wake up and you don't make your bed, you lack self-discipline. If you don't brush your teeth, you lack discipline. If, if you don't put the toilet up, down, whatever, you know. So let me use some layman's terms. If you, if you half-ass stuff in life, you know, then you, you lack the self-discipline. And I understand that some people did not, was not raised up with parents who were first disciplined themselves or did not instill discipline within their kids. So, of course, you know, that's why people are not disciplined. It's the causes and conditions of the family, the causes and permissions per dads, role models, etc., etc. So that actually leads back to um, the, the fallible nature of a human, right? The fallible nature of a human. So... Anyone who sees the value, the intrinsic value of these things, or what, however the teacher carries themselves, and you, and you like that quality, and you want to cultivate that quality, you would gravitate towards that teacher because you're like, wow. You know, like, 
I was raised up quite disciplined by a, a military lieutenant father. So therefore, later when I went into this tradition, I actually liked it because I was like, oh, wow, really strict teachers, just like my dad. <laughs> and whatever they told me, I was like, oh, okay, all right, I, I'm going to do it. You know, I objected less. Uh, so I just, you just learn so much about yourself. I mean, you try something new. Whether you are disciplined or not disciplined, try something new. You know, challenge yourself. If you challenge yourself, you learn new things. You discover things about yourself and you inspire others down the road. You see the, the threefold benefits there? And if you don't, then you'll be stuck in your old ways and your old days, simply put. Actually, all this has a lot to do with self-esteem too. It's because when you take... Or let's say you're wheelchair bound tomorrow or next month or next year. Um... You're going to be, oh man, you're going to blame yourself for all sorts of things. Did I did the best I possibly could with the time that I have, with the people that I was with, and the resources that is available to me? Or you're going to be proud of yourself. You're like, well, I'm wheelchair bound. I can't really do much. And I can't really blame myself because when I had full function and capabilities of a human, I did it. With the time that I had, with all the jobs I was juggling with, yeah, I found a teacher with the people that I was with and other students that was like-minded like myself. With the resources that was available to you, yeah, the Venerable gave me a free book, PDF, and Val gave it to me. And I had resources to fall, fall on. And I did study diligently. I studied my ass off, one could say, right? That's what common students say. <laughs> Any diligent student would say that. I study my tail off, my tailbone off. <laughs> um, so this is part of living the good life is uh, self-discipline and it cultivates self-esteem. Self-esteem is also rooted in accomplishing things, setting goals, challenges for yourself, accepting who you are, knowing your weaknesses, knowing your strength, channeling your strength to achieve that goal and in achieving that as close as to it as much as possible. And then realize that, wow, I did it, you know. So, you know, I grew up wanting to be a police officer, but that had a lot of self-doubts when I was younger. So finally, one day I just decided, you know, after, actually after completing CBT at age 20 something, I says, I don't care if I get hired or not. I know that I have three pages of traffic ticket and I'm like, I don't care about it. I don't care about a lot of things. I'm going to prove it to my darn self that I was, that I fit all the requirements to become one. And I did. I spent, oh my God, it's like $6,000, went down to the, you know, Manatee Technical Institute, tests, lab work, polygraph physical exercise finally everything all the results came in everything was perfect head to toe and then finally i was de denied and i was like i'm okay with that i am okay with that i have lived you know what i always wanted to be a cop i couldn't be a cop and uh you know now i'm here and uh i i, I didn't have to prove to anyone else i put to myself and i said great I guess I'll go back to college. They said, try back in three years, kid. Captain George Crowder, try back in three years. Got three pages of traffic ticket yourself? You want to give people traffic tickets? Don't think so. Come back three years. I said, I'll go to college in three years. I'll think about it after I get out. I went to college for four years, actually. So, now I get to sit in front of you. And you just analyze everything that I have done. I mean, I'm trying to inspire you all by and through my own actions. You know? Who, can, who here can say that I'm a lazy teacher? What evidence do you have to prove that I'm a lazy teacher? Everything is recorded live, by the way. See, one can say, yeah, GDAO is lazy because he just uploads. Like, we don't even know when he uploads. You know? Yes, ma'am. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You know? I have lived the blameless life. As blameless as it is ever going to get. You know? It's, trust me, just analyze your teacher. You chose me for a reason, 
and look at how I live my life. Look at how I lead. All right? been doing all your life <laughs> you know so if you want to go back to school do it just do it you know if you if you want a relationship really bad learn about it you want to conquer anger study it you want to meditate darn it sit down and meditate sit down and discipline yourself all right uh, yes ma'am I was going to say, um, you know, years ago I was in a really toxic relationship. So what I did was in order to add the traits and the characteristics that I was looking for in a, a healthy relationship, I ate my next boyfriend or my next partner. And um, when I met Eric, um, he checked off both, he checked off most of the um, check boxes. So I think that's another thing you can do. What are you looking for in friends? What are you looking for in your family? Boundaries. Um, nobody's going to do the work for you guys, unfortunately. I, I wish I could, but I can't. <laughs> so um, that really helped me in, in being in a, a more healthy relationship. Hmm. Very good. Anyone have any comments, remarks, questions? Confusions. We have a new student that just joined Shiba. Shiba, are you just now joining us? You have any questions you'd like to introduce yourself? Okay. All right. So now we move on to. Um, to uh, page 241, cooling down your anger. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, who would like to read um, page 241 all the way to 243? All the elements, key characteristics of unhealthy anger. A lot of people are angry and they don't know that they're angry. They're angry and they're in self-denial that they're angry. They're angry because they don't even know what constitutes anger. Anyone would like to read? Martha, Armani, somebody. Anger is a pretty common emotion, however. Huh? however I'm sorry, I can read the first page. Yes, go ahead. Anger is a pretty common emotion. However, anger is also increasingly recognized as an important emotional problem. Anger can be bad for your relationships, your health, and your self-esteem. In the battle days of psychological treatment for anger, People were encouraged simply to get it out, often by beating pillows to vent out their fury. The result, just like anything you practice, these people got, got better at being angry. The notion that expressing your rage can get it out of your system is something of a myth. More often, you wind yourself up further, generating more anger. A better solution is to get the grips with managing your angry feelings responsibly and to master skills that can help you feel you feel to less angry, less often. CBT often clears an effective management of anger by tackling the thinking that underpins your anger and helping your you express in a way in a healthy manner. This chapter focuses on CBT techniques that can help you deal directly with your feelings of anger. Should I keep going? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. Discerning the difference between healthy and unhealthy anger. 
Essentially, two different types of anger exist, healthy and unhealthy. Healthy anger is helpful annoyance and irritation. This is the kind of anger that spurs you on to assert your rights when it's important that you do so. Unhealthy anger is unhelpful rage and hate. This type of anger leads to you leads you to behave aggressively or violently, even in response to the mild of un, unimportant provocation. Unhealthy anger can also mean you bottle things up and you vent your anger indirectly, sometimes called passive aggression, or take it out on innocent parties. All emotions have themes that is a set of circumstances or triggers for which they are arise. Themes for anger include someone breaking one of your personal rules or threatening your self-esteem through word or deed. Another Another anger theme is frustration when someone or someone gets in the way of you reaching your goal. The triggers for healthy and unhealthy anger are the same. Behavior responses they typically produce are very different. Both anger, ty anger types are also associated with different ways of thinking, thinking and intention and focus. Um, the key characteristics of unhealthy anger. Unhealthy anger is far more likely than healthy anger to cause um, fractures in your personal relationship, create trouble in your career, or land you in prison. You're also likely to feel more physically and emotionally uncomfortable when you're, when you're unhealthy angry. Several ways of thinking typically underpin unhealthy anger. The way other people must or must not behave. Insisting that other people do not disrespect, insult, or ridicule you. Demanding that life conditions and other people don't get in the way of, of getting what you want. Overestimating, overestimating the degree to which people deliberately act in undesirable ways towards you. Assuming automatically that you're right and the other person's wrong. Refusing to consider another person's point of view and to accept others, others' right to hold a different point of view. Common behavioral characteristics associated with unhealthy anger include the following. Attacking or wanting to attack another person physically or verbally. Attacking another person in indirect, also known as passive aggressive way. For example, trying to make someone else's job difficult. Taking out your anger on innocent parties such as another person in animal or object. Plotting revenge, holding a grudge, attempting to turn others against the person you believe has behaved undesirably, sulking, looking for evidence that someone has acted with malicious intent, searching for signs of an offense being repeated, being over vigilant for people breaking your rules or acting disrespectfully towards you. Common physical signs of unhealthy anger include the following clenched fists, muscular tension, especially in the neck or shoulder muscles. Clenched jaw, tremble or shakily, shaking, raised heart rate or feeling hot. Thank you so much for reading that. Thank you. No problem. Anyone has anger problems besides myself? I do. <laughs> I do. I got anger problems. My name is G Dow and I have anger problems. <laughs> Who else? Had. I can't find a reason that I have now. It irritated, frustrated, yes, but I don't think I get angry now. It's just, it's just because it's again a lack of lack of deep understanding. Anger arises. It's like someone cuts in front of traffic, you know, for you, and it's <laughs> with like WTF? <laughs> you really? Because we don't understand their behavior, so we jump to conclusion. Then we get angry. Uh, it, well, there are a lot of causes for anger, actually. It's just something that I... I but, but is it okay when you're angry and start, like, you know, to be mad? and, and um, But you don't, like, you don't hurt anyone or um, do, like, crazy stuff. You're just angry alone and you be calm and then you go back to your normal stuff? I would rather people be angry to themselves, by themselves, 
than to act on that anger on other people. However, it is not healthy for your body. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. Like, like, is it okay, like, you're angry, but you can still control yourself and you don't hurt anyone, like, you don't make anyone mad or give him the same energy, but you're angry, but, like, it just, yeah, you still control it. Our goal here is, this is one of the poison in, Bo in Buddhism. There's only three poisons in Buddhism. This is one of them. You know, anger, no, greed, anger, and ignorance of the Four Noble Truth. And anger is aversion. Wanting something and not getting it causes a person to be angry. Getting something that you don't want, get angry. This is the second noble truth in Buddhism. You ever seen a little five-year-old not getting the thing that he wants? He gets pretty angry. <laughs> Throws a tantrum. Men don't ever grow up, so you see men, you know, do that too. When they try to order a big wheel for their truck and they don't get the big wheel, they get angry. <laughs> when they fix a car and they can't fix a car because something technical in there, they get really angry. They throw the wrench window you know There's a lot of causes for for anger and due to the causes and conditions when you were a little child if you were the only child in the family and you know you always had your way and now things don't go your way you would get angry <laughs> that was me by the way <laughs> and venerable i wanted to say um you know, we can think we're in control of our anger, uh. but control, we can mask that as depression. Mm. And so we can say, oh, well, I'm in control of my anger. Are you? Because you just lost it, right? So, like, I, I think about this time um, where, you know, I'm, I'm behind on bills, and I got very upset on the phone because I wasn't being heard. The, the customer agent or whoever I was speaking to was not listening to me. If you call me and it's about Bill, it's about money. I don't want to hear it's not about money. That's not the truth. That's not being direct in communication with me as the customer. Because I'm the customer, I give you money, I use your services, what have you, right? And so, in that moment, I thought I was in control of my anger. I wasn't. <clears throat> I've been watching my anger. And what happens is when you do not address your anger, and, and I have place to speak on this, both my brother and I have been very angry, and not even angry. Try rage. Try livid. That's a whole other level. That is where you see red. You're, you're not here. You're not in the present moment when you're in rage and, and when you're livid, right? So what I was hearing when this gentleman wasn't listening to me, I was no longer in the present moment. I heard my mother speaking to me and not listening to me. And I was rageful. I've, I, have ne I don't think I've ever behaved that way in my life. I got off the phone. and instigated me, I would have gotten physically violent. That's how upset I was, and that's how angry or so much rage I had that I was literally shaking. And I went into our room, and I threw things. That's how a child behaves. And adults can behave that way, too. But this is what happens when you think you're in control of your anger. You're not. You suppress it. You think you're in control of it, but truly it's depression, and then you're a bomb going off. This is an emotional reaction. You're not responding. You know, if somebody flips you off or somebody cuts you off, you could get out of your vehicle and get physical with somebody. You could then flip them off, and then they get out of their vehicle. Things can escalate very quickly if you don't deal with your anger. And what Thought Not Han says is transforming your anger, understanding it, 
addressing it, and, and not just addressing it, but sitting with it. Why am I angry? I'm angry because my mother didn't listen to me growing up. My voice was not heard. I felt invisible. That has nothing to do with this gentleman on the phone who's trying to help me with the bill. You see that difference between being in the present moment, right, with somebody who's trying to help me and being in the past? These are things, you guys, you cannot run from. I'm telling you right now. You continue to run from anger, you're the source of that. That's not going to affect anybody else but yourself. Everybody can... I'm sorry, hold, hold on one second. Everybody can hear me on Instagram, right? Yes, go ahead. Who, who, who wanted to speak? Go ahead. Lime juice. Yes. It just happens so fast. It's so hard to react, right? Like, you don't know what situations are going to, like, make you angry. But when it happens, like, the solutions to it, whether it's meditating, going for a walk, or, like, taking a bat and, like, going outside and hitting your grass, like, it takes time to do those things where, like, anger doesn't really give you time to react. Like, it's so hard to, it's so hard to, you know, like, contain it and, like, have a good reaction, you know? Like, it's hard to have a solution in the moment of anger. Mm, very good. Very good. I worked in customer service, and that when you mentioned that, it, it, like, brought me back. I did, like, seven years of customer service from everywhere in the food industry to clothing. And, oh, my God, there's just... I, I didn't, one thing I remember, I have not, like, not seen so many unhappy people, especially on a Black Friday. Like, <laughs> God forbid, if I ran out of something, like, I've even witnessed, like, a poor five-year-old almost getting trampled because there was an under, like, there wasn't enough underwear or something. It was just, oh my God, that's one thing I remember. <laughs> Anyone else? No, I absolutely. No, I just wanted to say I absolutely. 
totally agree. And it was hard, like, at being an 18-year-old doing it to customer service because I agree, you have to be very mindful during the conversation just out of your respect even for your job. Like, you have to, you know, you have to just be mindful of everything when people just get so overwhelmed or so, I mean, they potentially, yeah, absolutely, they can potentially get aggressive and you have to just be mindful of the conversation or if not, just walk away and, and find some like a manager to take care of it. Absolutely. <clears throat> oh, I need to disclose something for any teachers that's watching or the whole world's watching, actually. Due to digestive problems earlier, it has led me to de de deplete my myself and realizing this is a very big topic to, to uh, cover tonight. I decided to munch on some thin mints chocolate here to have some energy to remain in this. So that would be breaking the precept, but for medical reasons only. I don't want any senior level teachers watching right now. I'm mean, like, oh, well, he looks really relaxed. Not only he's drinking a bottle of water, he's also eating after 12. <clears throat> so, isn't um, it like eight hours, Venerable? It's like eight there. So, isn't it like eight hours that you're not right? It's after twelve. If this is an emergency, please hang up and dial nine one one. Para continuar en español. Oh my gosh! Stop it! He does this all the time to me, guys. Thank you for choosing Northside Hospital for billing. Please press two. If you like a payment plan, please press three. So when it comes to anger, it's exactly everyone here who contributed tonight. Your analytics about anger. As we will address how and how, how mindfulness plays a role in that, I wanted to, to talk about this is like a beach ball. When things don't go our way and we want things to go a certain way, if the causes and conditions caused us to be angry easily, in rage mode, putting holes in the wall, dent doors, car doors, broken glass window, look, we have all ways of showing, expressing, and manifesting anger. It's not a good thing. You don't want to be, you don't want to be 30 years old with high blood pressure. Why? Because high blood, pressure, high blood pressure is the silent killer. So if you have it, then you're just a ticking time bomb. You can die at any moment. You can have a stroke. Not pretty. Then that creates anxiety. And you want less anxiety in your life. Because the more anxiety you have, it also prompts more anger. <laughs> What's good is going to be good. And what is not good is not going to be good down the road. So anger is like, a, you know, suppressing anger is like, holding a beach ball underneath the water. And one day it has to come up. By and through meditation, we know when it's going to come up. When we investigate deeply the root cause of our anger, um, hopefully some insight, some, some light shine. Oh, my father was angry, so therefore I have a little bit of his genes, heredity. So on and so on. So some of the first things that change, right, when you get angry is your breathing. Your heart rate, your breathing, your veins starting to pop out of your neck. So these watches nowadays, these smart watches nowadays, tells you your heart rate. Actually, my watch tells me that I'm stressing. <laughs> it's like, you're stressed, take a break. <laughs> it's like, okay. It's amazing because it's unconscious level that you're not even aware of, but it's able to detect physiological responses in your body to let you know, hey, hey dude, get up, walk, five minutes right now. So these newer Apple watches, and I don't have an Apple watch, I have one of these cheap Garmin ones, like 50 bucks. Um, so using technology helps us more aware of our body and mind. So when, in meditation, when you're so in tune with your body, you actually are very vigilant signs of anger when it comes. And uh, we have to be careful when we're around other people, people who we have prior information about. 
So if I'm dating Karen or Rebecca or Anna and I have prior information about her, the things that she does, or if she has prior information about me, how I keep the toilet seats up, down, whatever, leave the shoes in the house, not outside of the house, don't do the dishes. Before you start arguing with someone and you already have prior information about them, wait for it because it's coming. You know it's coming. Mom, dad, uncle, grandma, whoever. Whoever you have previous information about, prior information and knowledge about, you get into arguments with them. The start of an argument or a pending argument, wait for it because you're going to use everything you know about them against them. Well, you always do this. You always put the shoes inside the house. You always leave the toilet down. You always leave the toilet up. You never do the dishes. I've told you this a million times. Why do you not take out the trash? The trash is in the house for five hours. <laughs> um, mindfulness meditation, you know, helps us aware of our thoughts, of our feelings, of our physiological responses, our breathing, the clenching of the fist. The, the rhythm of the breathing changes. And when it starts to change, you need to now take wise action to remove yourself from the stimuli. From the stimuli. When your senses are open, ayatana, <clears throat> eyes, ears, and when you're perceiving all of these things, the five aggregates, we just talked about the five aggregates last weekend. Last Sunday, I did a phenomenal job, by the way, explaining the five aggregates. One of the hardest things in Buddhism to ever explain. The five aggregates. Everything in Buddhism is hard to explain. So, <laughs> so when, you know, all of these start to spin and turn and the links of influence, you got to be aware of every single one of them. The first aggregate, the second, the third, making sense, perceiving, acting wisely. So that's why you have to practice. You cannot understand this on an intellectual level and be like, hey, great, Venerable said it. Okay, well, next time we argue, I'm going to be mindful of it. No, it don't happen that way. It don't happen that easily on an intellectual level. Loving kindness meditation also aims to start pouring water on your on your. Um, in the fire sermon. In the sutta, the fire sermon, talks about everything's on fire. Anger is fire, greed, lust, jealousy, everything's on fire, right? Your whole house on fire right now. So, realizing that we humans and we have these active fires, that is just kind of there. Sometimes your fire a little smaller than others. My fire, when I was a young child, was blue flames. <laughs> it, was, it was always blue flames. Smart people get angry very easily for some for some reason, for some odd reason. It's not odd. We know why, right? They get the point fast, quick. They're able to paint the picture quickly. So when someone ticks them off, they already they already know why. They already they already got the answers, or they think they have the answers, so they get angry very quickly. Donald Trump, ever see him get angry? <clears throat> Is he smart? I mean, he's a billionaire. One could assert so. Um, so the practice of loving kindness meditation is to pour water on these little fires. Sometimes little, sometimes they're big, but you're doing something about it. May I be well, may I be happy, may I be free. May I be free from physical suffering, may I be free from mental suffering. Physical suffering, mental suffering. You wish yourself that, okay? So the next time you get angry, you would remind yourself. brain cells arguing with this fool. A wise person, all of you. All of my students cultivate yourself to be the wise. And the wise don't chill with fools. And who are fools? Fools are fools that do foolish things, think foolishly. They walk, talk, their actions are foolish. If they have proven to have done something foolish before, they will do it again. So why would you put yourself in a position to be with fools where they will push buttons that make you angry? 
the potential and likely chance of you getting angry. Ain't worth it. If somebody gonna take you off, I hope you get paid a lot of money. Because you hang out with like, maybe like 20 fools in your life and you get high blood pressure, who's gonna pay for your amlodipine? Who's gonna pay for your blood pressure cuff? Who's gonna pay for your Littman stethoscope so you can take your blood pressure? Yeah, exactly. The wise do not put themselves in positions where they can get angry. Likewise, all of the good merits you have done in Buddhism, it can be extinguished quickly. With just one act of anger, you can wipe out all the meritorious deeds that you have done in your life. So you can see the attractive nature of anger and the unattractive nature of anger, both from a human standpoint and from a Buddhist standpoint. Simply put. Um, any questions so far? <clears throat> Confusion, remarks, comments? So, um, I used to work with kids, um, and I think that was like the best thing because you have to control yourself no matter what, like if, um, if something happened or anything, like you know kids are not easy sometimes. So you have to control yourself and I think that was the best thing for me because no matter if I had something happened with my relationships or anything, you have always to control yourself and be the best. So and I think that was the best thing for me. And anyway when you see kids playing and having fun and smiling, you forget anything in it. Like it's the best thing. So indeed, we need humans to survive no matter if we hate humans. Let's say we don't like humans, we hate humans, we don't want to be around them, they're annoying, they cost us a lot of money, they, they make us angry. Well, you gotta, you gotta study humans, that's why if I were to say you should study three things, three most important things in your life, it would be psychology, sociology, had it yesterday oh and business management I mean if we say four then Buddhism will be the last one but you gotta you, know, you gotta know humans you gotta know society you gotta know how to make money <clears throat> to survive because everyone here has got bills to pay so but the fact that um, the, f the fact that <laughs> you know my, my, my mom made me angry growing up so I made it my mission to study why why she is the way that she is. Probably. That's what I was wondering. Like, were you born angry? Were you born angry? Go like this. Yeah. So, um, you you have static on on your mic. If you could uh, mute your mic until you're ready to speak, real quick. Koto. Koto. Coco, if you could mute, mute your mic. Thank you so much. Or some, it's a staticky for some reason. It's like... <sighs> um, so when we, when we talk about the neurological aspect components of the brain is that number one, not everyone has a perfect brain. So there are certain circuits and synapses and wirings and firings of neurons, protons, electrons that programs a person to be more angry. Uh, the amygdala the limbic system. There's a book on it. It's called The Angry Brain. I think. It's been a long time since I opened that book. Um, but, again, there's a whole academic study of it. The science of anger. So, yeah. Some, if you had angry parents and if, you know, uh, they raised you and you could inherit some of their genes, angry genes. So the base, your baseline is, you know, probably a little bit angrier than most kids. And like we've see, also seen previously, some people are so mellow. And we love being around mellow people. We're like, oh my God, you're so chill. I don't ever see you getting angry. It takes a lot for that type of person to get angry. However, in Buddhism, we... 
cultivate deep understanding. If we have to be around these type of humans and people in our lives, we have to strive to understand them where, where they've been, where they are now, and where they're going to have understanding so that in case if they do make a mistake, we don't get angry at their mistakes. There are so many philosophies on anger, you know, getting what if something happened like really bad like like you know your boyfriend cheated on you or someone hurt you so bad like you can't control yourself well that's what we're doing here is we're learning to control ourselves our well no, I mean, yeah but i mean like sometimes it's just like i know everyone has like a little bit anger issues yeah so so, so that's attachment right so yeah i mean listen we're humans we're humans um w when we fall in love when we fall in love these things are bound to happen as long as you are in the skin in this little human skin you are subject to all sorts of emotions when people when people cheat lie steal from you right and that's what buddhism teaches you is that not to be attached to see Foolishness, when it is unfolding, usually, you know, the relationship will, you're going to see the loss of fire, and then subsequently it will lead to cheating because of the loss of fire, however that fire was lost. Whether, you know, intimacy, communications, you know, sex. So, I mean, the wisest way to respond from a from an I, I, ideal Buddhist standpoint is it's already been done. He already cheated on you. So getting angry at this point on forward doesn't change the fact that he already cheated on you. Now, how do we proceed forward intelligently and wisely? Which is to trace why this took place, how we, first and foremost, how we contributed to the downfall of this relationship leading to that cheating. Because someone is missing something. There was a missing component element uh, in this relationship you know, people cheat because they couldn't find what was in existing relationship so they would go out and they find it on the outside um, and you know they couldn't solve their own problems so they decided to solve the problem on their own on the outside seeking else elsewhere so it's it's pointless at, at, at that point to get angry you just have to see what is the attractive nature of getting angry right now with this matter of, of fact and a wise person would, that's why we have to be able to separate objectively our emotions and what's happening. Put that apart so that we can see clearly into the true nature of the reality of the problem. Typical humans, they just go with their emotions. They act on their emotions. Is it hurtful and painful? Absolutely. Absolutely. But in these moments are the moments where it, Everything that has been taught to you, me, what was taught to you by other teachers in Buddhism, CBT, this is where it matters. This is where you deploy and use what, I mean, what's the point of studying CBT? You can't use it. If you cannot pull it out of the cabinet right away, like emergency medicine. So, I hope that answer is that this is why we have to in our life there's going to be so many buttons that's going to be pushed from now until you die a lot of people are going to be pushing your buttons work home school and we have to respond to that skillfully so we don't accumulate negative karma and we don't go to jail or the hospital <laughs> it sucks being human first noble truth and if you think it sucks, well, don't come back. Be a fully enlightened being. But, but, now, but now we're here. We're stuck. We're here with the people that we're with. We got to deal with them in society as a whole. So when we meditate, oh crap! But when we meditate, we don't we don't meditate to get better at meditating. We get better at met. We get better at life.
when you meditate, you get better at uh, at life. Does that make sense so far? Any questions or confusion? Went to sleep. All right. So, assembling attitudes that underpin healthy anger, da, da, da. hallmarks of healthy anger, hallmarks of healthy anger, holding strong preference rather than rigid demands about how people should act, having flexibilities in the rules you expect people to abide by, strongly prefer that others don't insult or ri ridicule you, desiring that other people and life condition don't get in the way of getting what you want. Thinking realistically about whether other people have deliberately acted undesirably towards you, considering that both you and other people might be right and wrong to a degree, trying to see the other person's point of view and recognizing others' right to disagree with you, and behavioral characteristics typically of healthy anger include asserting yourself with the other person, staying in the situation with the intent of resolving any disagreement, requesting the other person to modify her behavior, and respecting her right to refuse to do so, looking for evidence that the other person may not have behaved with malicious intent, being able to forgive and forget. A lot of this can help uh, your relationship with people right now, being flexible, and looking at our preference, flexibility and preference. Two main keywords in all that. <sighs> Forming flexible preference. Accepting other people as fallible human beings. That was the last chapter. And I repeat it again in this chapter. Accepting yourself. Develop high frustration tolerance. I addressed that last chapter. Pondering about the pros and cons of your temper. Like I said, the attractive and unattractive nature of your temperament. So tonight I want everyone to write in their little journal, would I rather be right or would I rather be happy? Am I going to do the right thing or am I going to do what I really want to do? And in situations of anger, you know, typically these things, these are the questions you want to ask yourself. Would I rather be right or would I rather be happy? Calm or school? Am I going to do the right thing or am I going to do what I really want to do? Because right now you want to punch the wall. <laughs> right? Versus walking away. And folks, when it comes to your senses being open, you know, if you were deaf and you can't hear them, you wouldn't act on it. And also the meaning that you attach to what they said, which is what we've addressed earlier in CBT. A, 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 attaching meanings to, to things, words, and, and so on and so on. I think that's one of the biggest things that I have to learn. Do I have to... Um... Do I have to be right or do I want to be happy? Well, and do you want peace or do you want chaos? Hmm. More peace. I, I, I'm getting better at it. I used yeah. to be a lot worse when I was younger. Oh, of course. You don't need to talk to me. <laughs> Most of my 20s are just pure chaos. But, you know, you live and you learn. You know, do I want to live in chaos anymore? No. Okay, well then what am I going to do about it? Not going to surround myself with people who are dramatic, people who are negative, who are not doing anything with their lives and essentially not trying to become a better human being. That's just what I'm doing. That doesn't mean I'm not compassionate. 
you know, I understand people go through things in their life, but essentially if you're not moving forward, then you're either staying in place or you're moving backwards. Uh, one thing I want to talk about. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Martha. I just said I, 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 was, I wanted to say um, I, I, I agree. And also I feel like being an only child kind of did it a little bit. And I feel like, well, I'm always right then. <laughs> Martha, the need to be self-righteous, you know, just how right do we think we are? <laughs> what evidence do we have to, to, to think that we're right? Oh, man. Oh, the things that comes with being a human. Page 251 talks about asserting yourself effectively. One of the things that I have observed over my years about anger is that sometimes people get angry. Well, actually, most of the time people get angry. Is because they don't know how to communicate with other humans. If you're in positions of leadership or management and you don't know how to convey certain policies, expectations, and rules to other people, you can be very frustrated and you can get angry very quickly. There'll be steaming there'll be steam coming out of your ears while you're while you're working. Um and so page two fifty one talks about asserting yourself effectively. Who would like to read that? Page 251. I can read. Yes, go ahead. Uh, asserting, you, exerting yourself efficiently. Is that it? Uh, page 251 is a uh, assertion involves standing up, and then it goes from there. Asserting yourself. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Asserting yourself uh, for yourself. Voicing your opinion, feel, feeling firmly, so saying, what was that, erasing that your basic rights are considered, uh, appreciating differences of aggressions, and that it doesn't involve violence, uh, imitation, or disregard of rights of others. Using obsessing rather than aggressive is more efficient in getting you what you want. When you're being uh, aggressive, you are still in control of your behavior. But when you're unhealthy, it creates much of your behavior impulses. People are more likely to respond to your wishes when you are being assertive simply because you're making yourself clear, not because they're afraid of your anger. Uh, often, your aggression is about winning an argument and getting the other person back down. And agreeing that you're right. Sedication is not about winning her. Rather than assessing these about getting your point across, but not assessing that the other person agrees with you or agrees with you or backs down. If you have a tendency to be angry and get vulnerability or physical, aggression quickly give yourself time to go and count to ten or as high as you need to feel calmer you can then counteract in your next thinking and behavioral steps certification is a skill that you can practice many people with anger problems benefit from breaking down this into different form of steps you, you want me to read the steps? Oh, no, no, you're good, you're good, you're good. So, <clears throat> I wanted to take some time to talk about this. You see, folks, so when they do something that ticks you off, and in your mind you're like, this is always going to, this is, this is going to keep on happening. How the hell am I going to keep this from happening again? That's what we want. We want prevention. So I, I, I know in those moments you guys will be angry, taking a couple minutes to yourself. To, you got to cool. As soon as you get angry, take yourself out of the situation right away and say, I need a minute, go in the bathroom, splash some water on your face, get some clarity, cool down, let your physiological responses calm down, 
Let your body calm down so you can think clearly. Now, the art of persuading people, that's what we want. We want to persuade. We want to convince them not to ever do it again, repeating the same mistakes. And this could be a little child, not just an, an, an adult, but a little child, right? When If, you, if you're ever going to become a parent and if you scream, yell, not going to do you any good. They will rebel and they will do it even more. So the problem will continue to persist. If you're doing it to an adult, you want them, you want everyone involved here, child, adolescent, or adult, to come to a place of understanding where you're coming from. If little Joey writes on the wall at home, then you would calmly talk to little Joey so that he understands because they already feel guilt and remorse. Once you call him over and you're like, we need to talk now. <laughs> Listen, they know when they're in trouble. So their own physiological response is already kicking in high gears. So trust me, you responding in anger and their physio and their physiology the way that it is. Oh man, other literally. So again, we want it to stick. This is where we want to doubt some information in their mind, in their brain, so they don't repeat the same conduct. And how do you do that? Well, remember, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, right? It's what you say and also how you say it. So you say, listen, Joey, listen. You know, Joey, when you write on the wall, it's really hard to get it off. Now, mommy don't have time to sit here all day trying to get this thing out of the wall. And plus, do you see how ugly it makes the wall? When we got people coming in here, they're going to be like, what's happening? A tornado just went through the house. So it would help mommy out. It would help daddy out. If we draw on a piece of paper. And we can put that on the wall and take it down whenever. Right? And we can share it with people. And that's how it should be done. You know? Um, the right way. This is how we draw art. On a piece of paper. And we... Take a piece of paper and we demonstrate it and we draw it with them. All right? So that is an example of trying to persuade, convince an adolescent not to do something, again, like writing on the wall. Now, how do you do that with an adult? If someone breaks policy, let's say late to work. That's a very common thing. We would say, Tom, Tom, I got to talk to you, Tom. Now, Tom being late to work, he knows he's late to work. Again, he's already feeling bad and guilt and whatever chaos is happening in his life right now that's causing him to be late to work. As a supervisor, people... Be gentle over others. Be gentle over them. So, how do we approach things gently? Is that with deep understanding, we realize is that well he's late because there's probably issues in his life right now when we look at the science of time management holy crap there is a whole can of worms behind the science of time management oh sheesh hold on you guys more technological issues on Facebook Okay, we're good now. Never ending with technology.
And so I, I right now I'm explaining the anatomy of, you know, of Tom, whatever. You know, so Tom's already of the why he's he's late to work and to explain to him the effects of that with the company's mission and the level of productivity. So from a Buddhist standpoint, we, we want to start playing out scenarios that, you know, maybe there's something going on in his life or transportation problems in his life. He has to take the city bus and the city bus is late. You know, you got to investigate why is it a chronic issue, if, if or if not a chronic issue. Then we, again, we approach calmly, awareness to our voice, tone, and manner, rate, and rhythm, you know, and like, Tom, Tom, I, I'm just curious, what's, uh, what's on your mind lately, you know, anything at, at home, how's, how's work, how's home, how's school, how's the kids, how's the wife, what's going on? So when we approach from a sense of curiosity, um, we're able to get information more effectively, you know, to, to communicate even better, right? Rather than jumping the gun, rather than just jumping to conclusion and taking an authoritative uh, stance, which could cause resentment and anger long-term. Keyword, resentment long-term. That's what we don't want. We want long-lasting, deep, meaningful relationship with everyone, living in harmony and living in... Um, in peace with people that we're that we're working with, you know. So after obtaining information about Tom's life, however, some way, shape, or form, that things are going well or not going well, then we tell him that you know, Tom, you're making it very difficult for me in a position of management to allow this from happening. You know, because you realize that if I do it to you, I got to do it to other people. Hundred other people 20 other people 50 other people so you if we could wake up a little early if we could you know see the bus schedule so on and so on and we take another route we use iphone technology to show us where crashes typically don't happen it would help all in trying to affect companies overall goals and to make goals at the end of the month uh, Tom you understand that you know I have a boss too and he's gonna be looking at everyone's time cards and you know if I don't do something about it so on and so on so what we want here folks is to give wise counsel again the Kalyanamita in Buddhism which is the wise friend the good friend that gives wise counsel and that is how you will be remembered as one of the most beautiful as boss one of the most Beautiful as manager ever existed on the face of the planet as to how you respond to some of these things that people do. Um, working for you or in a company, so on and so on. So, you know, some of these examples can be applied. Work, school, life, balance. Do we have any uh, questions so far? You guys just have to be really creative. Think of ingenious ways. It just requires a little bit of planning and anticipation you know just getting angry is easy being hated in life is a very easy thing you just say the wrong thing and you take this big stance as a boss or a manager and you know you make enemies quite fairly quickly um, however being the most beautiful person they have ever dealt with worked for on the face of the planet that's that right there is is skillful that right there is hard and difficult and it is exactly that that makes you a noble human being, a noble Buddhist. Anyone have any questions so far? Okay, so we're going to wrap up this chapter. Coping with criticism. Okay, in, in parting. Uh, and the next page, 252. <clears throat> Coping with criticism is that in, in life, no one exempts praise or blame. So if someone is criticizing you for something, it's an opportunity for you to learn about yourself. Again, my professors say, when someone says something not nice about you, your, the way you respond is, tell me more, right? Because 
it's a good thing that they're criticizing or else you'll be blind to yourself and blind to the things that you're doing. Um, and it, it, it's a chance for you to improve yourself, actually. Sometimes they don't say it in a nice way, but that's okay. Don't take it personal. Uh, you can take these uh, these things that are crit uh, th these are some some pointers in the book. Criticism can help you improve your work performance and your relationship. You can assess criticism, decide how much of it you agree with, and reject the rest. Criticism is something pretty much everyone experiences from time to time. You cannot reasonably expect to always avoid being criticized. And the Buddha have already told you this. The Buddha says no one exempt from praise or blame, and that would that would be. That would be the blame card. Using using the disarming technique, look for a grain of truth in what the other person is saying and agree with her on that specific point. Show your critic some empathy. Ask your critic for more information about her point of criticism. Express your point of view as I feel statements. Okay. Acting assertively in the workplace, I've already I've already addressed that, but I just want to give some additional pointers in the book. Standards: Be a team player. Make allowances for other people's personal interaction style. Differentiate between professional and personal comments. Strike a work-life balance. Continuing on in the book. Put your point across positively. Assessing what you aim to achieve, taking time to think, leaving well enough alone, leaving well enough alone, uh, promoting a professional image, remaining professional, be punctual, be prepared, dress accordingly, be polite, keep home and work life separate. And the last pages talks about dealing with difficulties in overcoming anger um, you lack empathy and understand and the understanding of the impact your unhealthy anger responses have on those near you letting go of your anger means that you're weak uh, you think that your unhealthy anger helps you to control other people and encourage them to respect you your unhealthy anger makes you feel powerful your anger is self-righteous so these are some of the things I like everyone to dig deeper. If you have anger issues, again, study the science of anger. Um, let's see what else. Any closing remarks? I need to think in my head. Anyone have any uh, comments, questions so far? What was just read? a conversation with myself about the, the performance standard and allowing I, I just failed one of my um, classes for my certificate and it's something that I was pretty bummed out about but it's something that I had to have a conversation about you know it's just you know you're probably setting performance standards too high and you know you have to allow yourself to fail and you know allowing a you know failing stuff like one thing it's not going to prevent me from getting my certificate so i, I just had to have I, I just had this conversation with myself over the um yesterday actually oh. okay. okay all right we don't have any questions Last remarks before class concludes. I don't think I have anything else to add, and if I do, I'll probably add it t tomorrow night. So, so you know, take anger very seriously. Take your health very seriously. It's something not to be ignored. You know, don't don't let it go unnoticed. You know, anger proliferates across the world. Let's turn on the news and see how many anger angry people uh, there are. And so everyone here has a chance to inspire other people by and through your own actions, by and through the use of your speech and effective use of speech. Um, I think you all get the point, <laughs> simply put. When it starts to affect your life, work, relationships, 
it, it, that's clinical attention right there. All right, so some uh, some announcements for tomorrow after. Are you serious? All right. Um, some announcement for tomorrow, which is. Oh my God! Please don't share my video. What is this? Whatever. Okay. So I have been invited by a most venerable um, to give a talk tomorrow at 2 p.m. Florida Eastern Time, 11 a.m. California Time at the International Buddhist Meditation Center, IBMC. It's a Zoom thing. I'm not sure how they're going to do it, but obviously if you tune in to all of my platforms, uh, I don't know what topic. It's going to be a surprise. <laughs> and so tomorrow I'll be doing that for I think an hour, an hour and a half. And then Buddhism followed by our Discord session tomorrow uh, at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, same time as today. And that is pretty much it. Um, if anyone else have any questions before we end the night... These were two very important chapters in the book. We're almost done with the book. I'm super excited. Looks like we have another... We have like 120... 110 page left of CBT. Yeah, we should we should be done, I think. May. Yeah. 17, 18. Next week. And then... 1920 This is slightly off topic, but will we be talking about meditation today? What questions do you have about meditation? What can I do to help with my lotus pose? Because I try to see if my foot fell asleep after one minute, and that's, I, I'm actually determined to do, I know it's, I, I researched it a little bit, I know me and, uh, me and Val were talking about this on Discord, that's probably going to take me a little bit of time, but I wanted to see if there's anything that I can do that can help with my poses. Can I see? Can I see? Um, how are you entering, Lotus? Like, take a video and send it to me. Because you have to be careful with your knees. And the reason why I tell you this is because um, I can't remember what posture it is in yoga. But essentially, imagine if you're standing and you take one of your legs and you put it in half lotus. That is a posture. It's like this stand strat name is super stupid long. Sorry, it's how I feel. Um, nothing against the language. But... Um, you have to be very careful entering in that posture because you can put stress on the knees. And it actually happened when I was doing Ashtanga in the studio. I haven't been because I haven't been working. But because of the way that I was entering this posture, I actually, I didn't injure myself, but I was just kind of strained. And then on top of that, it's been a while since I've done that posture. But you want to be careful entering that because if you're not doing it correctly you're going to injure yourself another thing you could maybe look into is half lotus um i mean i don't think buddha would be like oh like you're awful because you can't get into full lotus like even for me full lotus probably after like mm, three to five minutes i'm done um i don't really the only time i like to be in lotus is if I'm at the end of a practice or possibly at the beginning 
or I'm doing some posture where I'm going to be in full lotus because there's other yoga postures where you're in full lotus. So you could be in full lotus and doing crow. There's like really more advanced postures where you can be in full lotus. So I would just be mindful um, entering that. And then if you can send me a video so that I can see how you're entering it. Um, you can also go online too and just type in um, instructions or what have you. Um, I used to watch yoga with Adrian a lot and sometimes she'll have videos on specific postures where she shows you how to do them, um, just basically the background on postures, like, you know, what it helps you with, um, how to modify if you have um, said, uh, said in injuries. Um, but when it comes to yoga, if ego is present, you're going to get injured. I almost have, and this is something that my teacher had spoken to me about because years ago I had my master's postures that I'm now just getting back into. So just be patient with yourself, be mindful because you don't want to put any strain on your body and you don't want to injure yourself. And just because you cannot stay in full notice. Um, does not mean that your meditation is good nor bad. You can just sit down and meditate and, I, you know, like Buddha's not like going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you. You know, I think more so he would want you to focus on your meditation rather than the posture, if that makes sense, right? Because when we sit, we sit to meditate. We don't necessarily sit to be in a specific posture now, Buddha is going to encourage you to get to that point, but right now, I think the focus primarily should be on how is your meditation going, right? You you commenting about, hey, I'm falling asleep, being aware of that and just telling yourself, hey, I'm falling asleep, let's come back to the breath. Thank you for that. One of, the, one of my biggest struggles, I think, would be is posture, because I'm starting to get... um arthritis on my lower back so it kind of tends to flare up time to time so I, I, I kind of like okay let me see if I can do that <laughs> regard to Theravada tradition but in Tibetan Buddhism um, when I go to the meditation center, like if I went tomorrow lately, I've been doing the Zoom meetings, um, I'll sit in a chair. Um, they do have cushions. I don't care about cushions, sorry. I want to sit in a chair. It's going to help to keep me upright, but I also should learn to sit down and have good posture as well because sometimes I can slouch, but if you need that extra support, that's fine. Um, I feel like, in my opinion, I don't know what venerable, venerable would say about that, but I think if there's some type of um, injury there, we, the Buddha would not want you to be in pain either, right? So maybe just finding, you know, modification or just sitting normally, right? Like uh, crisscross applesauce is okay. That's honestly how I sit, or sometimes I sit in half lotus. But I'm just naturally flexible. Those things just come to me. But full lotus? Mm -mm, I'm sorry. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'll do half lotus. But I would only do full lotus if I was truly practicing that. And for me, again, I want to focus on the meditation, right? How am I sitting more so than posture? Thank you. That really helps. So when you're people have this misconceived notion that you have to be in the lotus position in order to meditate. No. Let me share something with you all. Is that on, on a daily basis, moment to moment, when I'm sitting here, I'm mindful. When I'm sitting here, I'm meditating. When I'm writing, I'm meditating. When I'm reading out of the book, I'm meditating. Meditation, meditation does not mean that you just sit and focus on your breath. 
everything you're doing and as long as you know what is happening what is going on and you're not thinking about the past or the future you're mindful in those moments right if, if you're walking or running and you know that you're walking and you're running you're actually meditating in those moments did you all know that now you do so you need not to be in a lotus position so when you're people have this misconceived notion that you have to be in a lotus position so you need not to be you know you don't have to hold a rigid stance and position on i have to sit in a certain way you can lie down and meditate you can sit in a chair and meditate for people who have you know uh mobility issues and you know like earlier just months ago actually just like two months ago I had a meniscus issue in the right knee. I could not. I could do everything else. I could even run. But I just could not sit in a loaded position. And I was just like, oh, great. Not so much for pictures now. <laughs> but but I know this. So I, I know that everything that I'm doing in, in a day is mindful, is meditative. Right? You know? I'm not being forgetful. You know? Again, a Buddha is one which knows. All of us have Buddha nature in us, so you need not to be uh, in that position to to cultivate mindfulness. Everything you do, as long as again, the most easiest way and simplest way to live your life is that when you're picking up a pen, I know I'm picking up a pen. When I'm washing the dishes, I know I'm washing the dishes. Um, and you just enjoy those moments and don't be very mindful of thoughts that drag you backwards, thinking about yesterday, forthcoming days to come bills you have to pay etc etc so i know and, and if the lotus position is important to you then uh research on it uh as to why um look at from a medical standpoint why there's difficulties right look at height weight body mass index look at positions look at why it's going to sleep um it could be a vein issue could be a blood flow issue so you know investigate it it could be your body might be telling you hey i need you to I need you to take me to the doctor because i don't know what's going on either because <laughs> we cannot see inside of our body you know the, the, when when i sat and i realized when i got up from with this meniscus thing like i mean my whole life i've been active so and when i got up my body told me listen dude you're gonna get up real slow because Today you're 90 years old, and that's when I realized, okay, all right, I guess it's time. All right, so whatever you know, depending on your age, again, age, height, weight, all of this medical um, um, elements that could be affecting where you are right now with with your body. Again, the body is a very complex system, um, and we just don't know, you know, why it's not conforming to what we need it to do. Uh, it's even, even more frustrating when you see monks, you know, sitting so comfortably for so long or other people in yoga classes and meditation classes sit for so long. You're like, why I can't, why can't do that? <laughs> what the heck's going on here? Okay. So that's the simplest answer for you. Thank you. That, that helps a lot. Cause I, I kind of like, for me while I was meditating, it was really helpful if I leaned against something, but I felt like I, I was cheating because I was like, well, I see everybody else. It's like, like for like 30 minutes and I can't do it. So, so I felt like, I don't know. Look up way. Right. Okay. Yeah, I felt, I felt like I was cheating. <laughs> yeah, I was actually upset for a good minute, actually, because I was mad at my body for a second. I was like, wait a minute. I'm not supposed to be having meniscus issues at age 34. <laughs> Anyone? Bailey, no, no. Anyone have any uh, questions uh, concerned about meditation or tonight's class? No, no further questions. No I have a question. Yes, ma'am. What should I do like my hands, like when I'm meditating? 
right over left with the two thumbs barely touching each other. Right over okay. left, flat out, flat out. Right over left with the two thumbs barely touching each other. Uh, and it is located right where your diaphragm is, where your tummy is. And real nice and relaxed. So a lot, a lot of those pictures you will see on my Instagram um, of, you know, how I sit and I meditate. If you could, like, go all the way down. Um, I haven't posted any pictures lately of me meditating, but, or you just go back to a couple videos, you'll see, you'll see it. But again, it's not necessary. Um, the, you know, we wanted to replicate the Buddha back in his days where his back was straight, shoulders relaxed, and he was sitting in the lotus position with his hands the way that they are, you know, but it's, again, it's not necessary. You can still become enlightened without having to sit like that. <laughs> Simply put. Um, Venerable, I actually have a picture, but I noticed my left is actually over my right. Um, but the, like, the thumb placement is there. <laughs> hmm. So I just posted that. And I'm in full lotus, Martha, but that didn't last. I swear, it didn't even last, I don't think, two minutes. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank you. That makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> yeah. You're supposed to have fun in meditation, period. You know? Yeah, like, it's not, Martha, think about it like this. It's not a competition. That's how yoga is, too. There shouldn't be any ego in yoga. It's a practice, just like mindfulness, just like meditation. Um, it's a journey. You know, where I'm at right now in yoga is because I've fallen on my face. I have been adjusted multiple times um so you know in that practice i'm learning patience i'm learning i'm growing right i'm not getting things correct all the time like people will tell me oh your crow is so good and it's like yeah because i fell on my face all the time and every single time i fell on my face i tried it again i tried it again so yeah there's no good or bad meditation meditation is just meditation okay all righty if everything is satisfactory to the class to the messenger uh, or the group chat or whatever that's on here um, we have new people joining in um, in general, there's, there's going to be a lot more joining in. Um, as you guys see that my Instagram blew up very fast. I don't know. I think I do. Um, so expect it bigger. And I'm trying to come up with additional programs for the rest of the year as the CBT will be concluded. Um, will be concluded around May. But it, it's, it is the practice here that is going to be most important. How you maximize benefits and outcome is by and through practice, not just intellectual understanding. Okay. Uh, and I will probably formulate a, a small team to lead the next CBT class. I don't know when. Um, and, of course, uh, we, we just have a lot to do this, this year. And I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with all these people that's new that is coming in. So they have some catching up to do. So there's this balance with seasoned students and new students coming in, the, the mixture of the two. But everyone help me out with uh, introducing, I'm sorry, with helping students introduce themselves when they come in, especially when we are mindful of all the new um, names that are present on the group primary chat. And, you know, uh, if Valerie don't get to them or I don't get to, to them, you know, just introduce yourself like, hi, I am a uh, student of the Venerable and uh, please introduce yourself. The Venerable would like to know your age, you know, how you found us and what are your goals in this discord. So that way, you know, the age thing is very important because that's how I'm able to gauge their level of maturity and what issues they're dealing with right now in life. Uh, so that I can better assist them based on where they're at. And it also gives everyone a good idea of, you know, who we're talking to. 
yeah, uh, again, there's uh, sometimes people put comments on there and we're like, huh? And <laughs> the first thing I ask Val is, how old is this person? <laughs> and again, the youngest one is 13. That, that, that was like four days ago. And so this young man from, from the UK, we got a lot of people from the UK too, by the way, was like, um, yeah, I, I read all of the chapters and I was like, okay, so I, I will. A young student has in fact done all the work that we have done <laughs> at a very high rate of speed. Well, uh, so class is now over at 10 p.m. Uh, enjoy your Saturday, and if you can join tomorrow, the International Buddhist Meditation Center talk at 2 p.m. Florida time. That's wonderful, and if you can join us for Buddhism tomorrow night at 7 p.m., that would be great. I'm not sure which topic I'm going to be touching on. Uh, which topic are we touching on, Miss Valerie, for tomorrow night? Great, wonderful. That's how I see how mindful you guys are. Uh, yep, so we'll be doing those two in the Noble Wakeful Path. And then probably additional talk on meditation next. Okay. So, you all have a wonderful Saturday, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, maybe I should turn off YouTube and stuff. It's still going. Okay.